Hey guys, Dr. McDonald. We're going to start on our cell biology chapter. I've got two PowerPoints. This is a lot of stuff, but we'll still stay with our 30 minute format. So I have no idea how many parts they're going to be, but we're going to keep them kind of reasonably sized. So let's continue with our thing. Cell structure, the cell theory, what they what has been postulated and all but proven is that the cell is our smallest living thing. You know, whether it's a bacteria or one of the cells in our body, the cell is the last is the lowest level that we can consider living. We talked about that a little bit in chapter one. Everything that our body does, the organs and the entire body depend on the cells doing their job. All the cells do their job and their, their job is added together and it makes something, for example, when your muscle contracts, when you move your muscle, you're contracting individual muscle fibers or muscle cells and the total of all that depends on how much force you exert. Same thing would be true with the cells in the liver or the pancreas or anywhere. This is, this is just one of our characteristics. Now the chemistry, I know <laughs> you guys, we just got finished with that, but the biochemistry of the cells depends on where they're at and what kind of structures they have in there. For example, the liver detoxifies things like alcohol and drugs. And so they have the right enzymes in their smooth ER to do that. Other cells don't have that. So depending on the job that the cell actually performs, they're gonna have specific structures inside the cell that help with that. Continuity of life has a cellular basis, except for our brains, our cells are almost completely different than from when we were born. Now our brain cells, those guys last for over 100 years plus, but the other cells wear out and they're replaced. All living things are made up of one or more cells. That's why we don't consider viruses to be alive, because they don't have a cell. They're just a piece of DNA or RNA. Cells are the basic unit of structure or function, absolutely. All cells come from pre-existing cells. So all of us were born when mom's germ cell and dad's germ cell got together and merged and the DNA came together and that was our origin. And we doubled to two cells to four and then so forth to our current state. Cells contain the hereditary information which is passed from cell to daughter cell during cell division. They're, what they're referring to is our DNA. That's the, that is the code book that's going to determine how tall we are, what eye color we have. All of these things are going to be is going to be programmed into our DNA. We get that from our parents. You know, one of, we might and we might get something that our parent doesn't have, but that they receive from their parent. So you may be getting something from your grandparents through your mom or your dad. All cells are basically the same in chemical composition. They basically do the same things, but there are some specification, special things that we have for these guys. Here's a little model of a cell. The three parts that they're talking about is the plasma membrane or the cell membrane. I always say plasma membrane because that was the way I learned it the inside of the cell, the cytoplasm, and then the nucleus, which contains the DNA. We'll talk more about the, the specifics of this coming right up. We're going to get a lot of specifics. The plasma membrane, we talked about this in the chemistry chapter, how 
we have a phospholipid. So there's a fatty acid chain. There's an unsaturated fatty acid chain, which has that little kink in it. Here's the glycerol, and there is the phosphate group with its charge. Now, the phosphate group, since it's charged, likes to be close to water. The fatty acids, which have no charge, do not want to be with water. So if you pour oil in a glass of water, they may mix just very shortly, but sooner or later, they're going to separate naturally because the polar water and the nonpolar fats don't like to meet to match. Now, if you look right down here, you see this is a cell membrane. You notice that the phospholipid heads are on the outside and those fatty acids are on the inside. So there is water outside the cell, there is water inside the cell. And if you put these phospholipids in water, they're going to naturally move like that. It's the same as oil separating from water. It's just, it just, it's just, uh, it occurs. So the hydrophilic or the water loving phospholipid heads are going to face the water. The, phos the hydrophobic fatty acids are going to go here. Because of this, most charged particles cannot go through your cell membrane. So if you have something like sodium, which has a charge, it cannot go through there. Non-polar stuff, anything that's lipid, will go through your plasma membrane like it's not there. It's, there's no barrier. It's, it's invisible as far as that's concerned which is going to be kind of an important thing. So the plasma membrane, here you can see the phospholipids. Now they've got some things stuck in there. We'll talk about that in just a second. It's a, we usually call this a phospholipid bilayer because you have two layers with one phospholipid head facing the outside and one facing the inside of the cell. This thing has a lot to do with keeping things in and out of the cells. The fluid outside the cell is called extracellular. The fluid inside the cell is intracellular. And I usually just, I refer to those as ICF and ECF. Interstitial fluid also is the same thing as the extracellular fluid. All right, guys, that should be pretty reasonable. Now let's talk about this cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is everything that's inside the cell membrane and outside the nucleus. That's the definition. That means that it also contains the organelles. The organelles are part of the cytoplasm. Now the cytosol is going to be the watery part. That's going to be things that are dissolved in water, proteins, salts, and sugars, and all this sort of thing. Now, the part of the cytosol that is closest to the membrane is actually more gel-like and more watery on the inside. Yet, the organelles, we talked about these little organs for the cells. They do specific jobs, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. So, those together. Now, this is something that folks mix up on the test and get wrong. Cytosol, water, cytoplasm, everything inside the cell but outside the nucleus. What's inside the nucleus is not considered to be part of the cytoplasm. There's another name for it, wouldn't you know it? We also have inclusions. Those are, those are little bubbles that actually have cell membrane forming a little sphere around them. And these things can have glycogen, can have pigments, lipid droplets, crystal. I mean, there's anything that we want to have contained. And we're going to talk some more about some others, but the inclusions are just little, they're like grocery bags. They just contain molecules that we want to have 
segregated from the rest of the cell. It's the easiest way to say that. Now, as far as our organelles, they come in two flavors, membranous and non-membranous. Membranous means that these organelles are also surrounded by a phospholipid bilayer. So that same thing that surrounds the cell and makes up the cell boundary is also going to surround some of these organelles, not all of them. So the membranous ones will be the mitochondria, peroxisomes, lysosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, of which there's two types, and the Golgi apparatus or Golgi complex. Most of the time I just refer to it as the Golgi, but you know, whatever. The non-membranous is going to be a cytoskeleton. Those are going to be fibers that are going to kind of reinforce the shape of the cell. We'll talk about that. The centrioles, which are going to be making fibers involved in cell division, and ribosomes, which are collections, they're organelles that make proteins. And we're going through all of that, guys. So the nucleus, the nucleus has got a double bilayer of phospholipids. So it's got a double covering on it. Now, on that double covering, we've got these little holes called nuclear pores. Things have to go in and out of the nucleus all the time. Hormones from wherever have to get there. But the most, one of the most important things is we have to make a copy of the DNA and send it outside the nucleus to where the ribosomes are so we can make proteins, enzymes or structural, what have you. So if you think of the DNA as being like a reference book in a library where you can, you cannot take it home with you, you can't check it out. You have to make a copy. Nowadays, probably a photograph. When I was doing this, it was, you write it down. So that's what we're basically gonna do. We're gonna make a copy of the DNA and it's going to leave to go to the ribosomes. Okay, genetic library with blueprints for all cell proteins. This guy is like a recipe book for proteins. Responds to signal and dictates kinds and amounts of proteins to be synthesized. Some proteins, we don't, we don't make these guys all the time full blast. There's a control mechanism with them, whereas some are only produced when the brain tells it to. That's what the hormones go in there for, is to turn on a section of the DNA so it'll be copied. Otherwise, it's going to be off and no copies are going to be made. There's, there's a lot on the control mechanisms of there, but we're not going into that right now. Most cells only have one nucleus. There's some exceptions. Now, your red blood cells have no nuclei. There is no nucleus in your red cell. They get rid of it. The red cell is basically just a lipid bilayer, a bag of hemoglobin. The cells on the outer layer of your skin have, are filled with keratin and they have no nuclei. They're not really what you would call alive. The muscle cells of your skeletal muscle, the muscles that you voluntarily move, the cells that break down bone and some of the liver cells have more than one nucleus. There's also some disease conditions that will cause you to have multiple nuclei. Okay, continuing on. Fluid mosaic model of the plasma membrane or cell membrane, that's just what it's saying. This is the thing, guys. Those, those lipids can move back and forth, up and down inside this, this bilayer they're perfectly free to move. They don't move in and out. Why don't they do that? Because of those nonpolar tails. The nonpolar tails does not like water. So that's what they, what they mean when they say fluid mo mosaic. These guys have some ability to move 
around laterally, but not in and out. These guys are proteins that are embedded in or on the plasma membrane. Some of them, like these peripheral membranes, either on the outside or the inside, they don't go all the way through and therefore doing things on the inside and we'll talk about that too. Then you got these integral membrane proteins that go all the way through. Some of these guys are going to be channels. They're going to, I told you that charged things can't come in. Well, sometimes we have to bring charged things in or out. So we have to have a channel to allow them to do that. If you look over here, this guy is a glycoprotein. So there's that protein right there. And what you're seeing there is a chain of sugars. We also have glycolipids. And that's where that phosphate head has a lipid carbohydrate chain or has a carbohydrate chain um, attached to it. In other words, we can have sugars attached to proteins. We can have sugars attached to the heads of the, of the phospholipids. And I don't know, those four rings right there, those are cholesterol. We have about 20% of the plasma membrane is cholesterol. Cholesterol stabilizes it, makes it a lot more sturdy. So that's what we use it for. Okay, membrane, lipids, 75%, phospholipids, we talked about that. 5% are those glycolipids. We talked about those with the sugar chains on them. And 20% of it is going to be the cholesterol. The membrane proteins, the integral, go all the way through transmembrane. A lot of these guys are channels and carriers. We'll talk about that. Some of them are going to be enzymes or even receptors for things like hormones or other signaling molecules. The peripheral proteins are loosely attached. Uh, they have filaments either on the intracellular or they can have glycoproteins on the extracellular surface. These guys can be enzymes or motor proteins, cell links to other cells, can provide support and form something called a glycocalyx. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute. Okay, as far as the junctions, we have three types of junctions that cells have to connect them to one another. Now, some cells need to be connected in a sheet. Others don't need that much um, packing, but we'll see these. A tight junction this is something where you want to keep things from going between the cells. If you look right there, it looks almost like it's sewn or stitched. So you have these proteins that bring these plasma membranes of each cell extremely close together. These things are to keep things from going in between them. Things where you don't want things to leak out, like in your kidneys. Once you flush the bad stuff or filter the bad stuff into the inside the, the kidney, you don't want it going back out. We also use this with like the blood brain barrier. We don't want anything to get into the brain except what we want in there. So tight junctions are just what they're, they're just to keep the cells. I mean, they're not going to have the entire cell. They're just going to be kind of like spot spot stitched and that's going to keep things out now there's some water and some things can leak in there anyway but for the most part they're very they're very functional desmosomes these guys get these flat disc like things on the inside of the plasma membrane and you got the same one on the inside of another cell and then you've got these connectors, these glycoproteins, the cadherins. And these guys are like welds or like rivets. They're going to hold the cells together. Now, cells aren't very sturdy. We don't have a cell wall. 
So what happens is these intermediate, intermediate filaments that are attaching on the inside of this, of this um, disc, they're going to go all the way through into the next cell, to the next uh, desmosome right here, and then so forth. And this is, helps to keep sheets of cells together. We'll talk more about sheets of cells when we get to uh, chapter 4, but it's kind of important, guys. Okay. Transmembrane proteins. Hmm. Did we miss one? No. We, oh, I see. It's down here. Transmembrane. These are called gap junctions. You've got these in the heart and in some other selected places. And what these guys are, they attach the two cells together but they're basically a channel or a tunnel so that things can go from one cell to the other without having to go through all the trouble of getting out of one cell, floating across and getting into the other. That's going to be super important when we get to um, the heart and AMP2. They're transmembrane. They go through the, the entire membrane of two cells and that, that works pretty good. <clears throat> okay, how does the cell react with the things around it? That's going to be those glycoproteins and proteins of the glycocalyx. It's a sugar coating. We've got some receptors in there that respond to chemical signals from other cells or from hormones that are put out at the command of the brain. We've got these cell adhesion molecules as well. Cell adhesion molecules, these are going to help to anchor the cell to the matrix or the fibers that are outside the cell or to each other. Uh, I know we've, we've got all this. This is for those that don't use the tight junctions. They can assist one cell moving past the other if it's necessary. Like during development, we have a lot of cellular migration. The, the cell adhesion molecules of the blood vessel will attract white cells to injured areas. So if we have like, we get an abrasion, we get our, our elbow scraped and it gets bloody and the skin is torn, then bacteria have a chance to get in there. So what we're going to do is these cell adhesion molecules are going to help the, the white blood cells slow down and get out. This is an AMP2 topic, so I won't go too, too far with that. Stimulate synthesis or degre degradation of adhesive membrane junctions. Uh, yeah, if it's necessary, they, they can help, help us disconnect the cells one from another. Not really a whole lot to that. Transmit intracellular signals to direct cell migration. We already talked about that. Anyway, that's what we've got, guys. That's these cams just help to hold them together. They help them to move past each other. They are in the blood vessels. They help with uh, getting the good guys to the bad, to the injuries, uh, to get rid of the bad guys and help to cell migration, which doesn't happen a whole lot in adults, more, more of a, a development thing. Membrane receptors, contact, touching and recognition of cells in normal development and immunity. One of the things we have on the cells that make coverings, we'll talk about those later, they have contact inhibition if they are touching other cells on all sides, they won't divide and make more. When this is not followed, it's when you have a cancer that disregards that. Chemical signaling from neurotransmitters, hormones, paracrines are signaling molecules that are used locally that are going to change that cell's proteins either the enzymes, they're going to change the chemical biochemistry or open up channels 
for the ions. We'll talk a lot about this. G protein linked, this is what we call the second messenger. We'll talk more about that when we get there, but these guys bind to a hormone or a signaling molecule and they cause a, a cascade, kind of like dominoes, inside the cell until we get the, the actual thing that we're after done. Okay, guys. Contact signaling, again, you see the, the uh, glycoprotein, you see the, that glycocalyx, there's a receptor on the other cell, and that, by uh, binding to that, it lets this cell know that there's another cell right there next to them. Glycocalyx, if I were to give you one short definition for it, I would call it the cell's ID. That's something that we use so that our immune system will recognize our cells as being us and not foreign. And when that fails is when you get the autoimmune diseases. Let's see, guys, I may need to... Eh, I think we will move myself a little bit. Plasma membrane receptors that bind to ligands. All a ligand is, is a molecule that binds to a receptor, okay? That's it. Whatever that receptor is, signal, or this this is one that opens up a channel to let, let sodium in or potassium out or whatever, calcium. So a ligand just binds to a receptor and it causes something to happen. Uh, neurotransmitters or ligands Hormones, some of them are, some of them will go straight through the plasma membrane and go to the, to the nucleus. Paracrines are just locally acting signaling molecules. I, don't, I, I want to try to, I want to give you a good overview, guys, but I don't want to get into the AMP2. That's when we start talking about endocrine system. Okay, here's a good example of the second messenger system. So there's the G protein. So there's a signaling, a ligand that binds to that. When he binds to that, this guy is going to bind to GTP. And this G protein is going to move using the energy. And he's going to bind to another protein. This protein is going to cause another protein or or chemical molecule to be changed. Now a lot of times that's going to be cyclic AMP, CAMP, and that CAMP is going to turn on something. In this example, kinase enzymes. In other words, it's going to turn on an enzyme which is going to cause a, a, a chemical reaction to take place. Okay, let me look at this and move myself. Log in first messenger, activated receptor, G protein turns on, goes and binds to the another protein. Second messenger gets turned on by this effector protein. And then when he's turned on, he turns on this. A lot, this is a lot like a bunch of dominoes falling over, guys, to be totally honest with you. It's a cascade. See, now that ligand could be one of those polar hormones, and they cannot get inside the cell. So what they have to do is have a hand off the message to another protein. So if it's kind of like a relay race where they pass that baton. One person runs a certain length, and then they hand it off. So in this case, the message comes from this guy, but since he cannot come in, he gives it to another, and that's this guy here, the second. Electrical signaling. Um, we have, we're going to talk a lot more about this in the muscles and in the nervous system this semester. We have voltage-gated sodium channels. Inside the cells has a certain voltage, and when 
anything disturbs that, especially if it changes it in a certain direction, these guys will open up. That's a sodium channel that allows sodium to come from the outside to the inside. This thing opens because the inside of this uh, cell has changed in voltage. Um, nerve impulse, uh, not uh, we'll talk about that with the neuron. Um, and after it's been open for a while, it will just automatically close. Now this is all done on the voltage of the inside. On the other hand, oops, sorry. On the other hand, we also have ligand gated channels, but this is really not the best place to talk about that. Okay, cell organelles, uh, we have an uh, organelle that performs a special task for the cells, just like our organs do for our entire body. Membranous or non-membranous, we've talked about that. The membranous organelles work together, and we call that the endomembrane system. Endo meaning inside the cell membrane. And we're going to see how those things work together by passing things off. Going to move my picture again. Okay, so there is the nucleus. So the, M, the, the, the copy of the DNA goes out. Now, there are ribosomes that are in the cytoplasm, and they can make proteins. And they usually, those are proteins that are going to be used inside the cell. Sometimes the cell will make proteins not for itself, but for the rest of the body. So we've got this thing here, this flattened sacs called the rough endoplasmic reticulum or rough ER. The, the messenger RNA with the copy of the DNA will go there to the ribosomes in there. They will make the protein and the protein will be modified inside the rough ER. Then this guy is going to going to like wrap this in a membrane bubble and then it's going to move over here to the Goji. So how would I describe the rough ER? It's a protein factory. It makes proteins. How would I describe the Goji? The Goji is like a UPS shipping center. It's going to package, it's going to modify those proteins and then it's going to release them in a membrane bubble, which are going to the to the plasma membrane, where they will they'll do something called exocytosis, basically dump it out. These guys work together. We've got lysosomes. Lysosomes contain some really strong chemicals, and their function is to break down old and worn out organelles or other things and they'll break it up. They'll, they'll do catabolism on it. Uh, peroxisomes we use to keep toxic oxygen molecules from damaging our cell. Uh, free radicals, I think most folks have heard that term. Okay. Okay, starting right here, we're going to start with the mitochondria. Remember, it's got, a, it's got a membrane. As a matter of fact, it's got two membranes. It's got an outer membrane and an inner membrane. Now, the outer membrane is right there, and then there's a space between the outer and the inner membrane, and those are called the Christi. Inside the inner membrane, we call that the matrix. Now, there are some ribosomes in there because if you remember, I told you the mitochondria has its own DNA and RNA, and its DNA is more like bacterial DNA than it is like human. These are the guys that make the ATP for us. They need oxygen to do that. So that's their thing. We're going to go through how they do it, you know, at a, at a different time. But... That's, they need those two membranes in order to do it. I'll just say it that way. Uh, this guy looks like some sort of bean. 
If you look at it in a cell model, it looks like a bean of some tor of type, more like, I don't know, pinto or peas or whatever. Okay. That's, and if I describe this with one word, it's energy plant. It produces the the most ATP that we use to stay alive. And if this guy doesn't work, we're not going to be alive. Ribosomes, we've already talked about, about those. Those are made of protein, and if you remember back, they're also, part of it is made of a special type of RNA called ribosomal. This is the place where proteins are linked together, where we take those amino acids and link them together. I'm watching the time, guys. I just want to get to a convenient place to break off before we start the next video. Uh, we got ribosomes that are free that are in the cytoplasm that will be taking care of internal protein synthesis. And then the rough ER for export. We already talked about that. So I don't know if you guys noticed, but if you look at the plasma membrane on the nucleus, the nuclear envelope, it actually just kind of turns into the rough ER. So things can go out of these um, nuclear pores and go straight into this. The rough ER looks like a, a bunch of pancakes. It's flattened sacs. The smooth ER, which does not do the protein synthesis, looks more like, I don't know, tubes, a, a bunch of interconnected tubes. Uh, these things are continuous with the nuclear membrane. In other words, the nuclear membrane basically turns into this. Okay, rough ER, the reason they call it, I'm going to go back one. The reason they call it rough, those little dots you see there are actually ribosomes attached to the rough ER. They call this smooth because it doesn't have the ribosomes attached. Integral proteins, phospholipids, all the secreted proteins. The smooth ER, it depends on where it's at as to what it does. I think I told you guys in the liver, it's going to make cholesterol. Yeah, we make cholesterol. It's going to break down the glycogen into the glucose. It's going to detoxify a lot of our drugs, uh, all kinds of harmful chemicals, pesticides, carcinogens. It's going to make lipid steroid-based hormones inside the cells of the bowels. It's going to be involved in absorption and putting together and transporting of lipids or fats. In the skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, we actually keep calcium in there, and then we let it out when we want the muscle to, to actually contract. We'll talk about that more in detail when we get to the muscles. The Golgi, also those stacked and flattened sacs, this guy's going to modify and package the proteins and the lipids for export. The vessels are going to come from the endoplasmic reticulum and they're going to merge with the, with the phospholipid bilayer of the Golgi. And by doing that, they're going to empty their contents inside the Golgi for it to be processed. Uh, we have a cis and a trans face of the Golgi. The cis face is the face that is facing the rough ER. The trans face faces the plasma membrane. So it comes in through the cis face and it gets processed and it leaves through the trans face and goes to where they need to go. So there's the proteins from the rough ER. You see them forming little little droplet sacs. Um, vesicle is our, we might as well go ahead and use that, the proper term. I keep calling them little bubbles because it's easy for people to visualize, but these are vesicles. They're going to come to this cis space of the Golgi. They're going to merge with it and 
dump whatever they've got from the ER in there. It's going to be modified, and then coming here, you see the transpace. The Goji is going to form a vesicle. It's going to travel to the cell membrane, and then it's going to merge and release uh, the product out into the extracellular fluid where it's going to make its way to wherever it needs to go. So a lot of things like this, um, thyroid hormone is modified amino acids and the thyroid hormone is produced by the thyroid gland for the entire body and it's going to do basically this to send it out. Peroxisomes, these guys have got some some enzymes, oxidases and catalases. So this is to any kind of oxygen that is what we would call a free radical, we're going to get it um, neutralized by these peroxisomes. Like you can get an oxygen with three oxygens and a negative, it's an anion, that is very toxic. And there's, there's some talk about the free radicals being maybe responsible for a lot of the uh, cancers that we get. So obviously it's pretty important that we get rid of catalase will actually, will actually break down hydrogen peroxide. <clears throat> you could put hydrogen peroxide on your wounds or your cuts or whatever but all you're going to do is you're going to get the bubbles to bubble out the bad guys they will not kill it because we break down hydrogen peroxide in our cells so it won't stay hydrogen peroxide it'll turn into oxygen and water so anyway peroxisomes are there to protect us Lysosomes, I've already talked about these kind of contain acid hydrolases, very toxic. Now, for the white cells that swallow up the bad guys, they put them in a lysosome. There we have a vesicle containing a bacteria or whatever, and then we have the lysosome and they come together and they merge and we dump all those acid hydrolases and it kills the bacteria and actually breaks it into component pieces. Now that's what we do for our uh, white cells. For most of the cells, like I was saying, we're gonna use it to recycle things that are worn out because we're gonna reuse the amino acids and all this that we can. Anything that we can reuse, we will. Break down the glycogen break down bone with the calcium uh, to release calcium and also to help us to get rid of cells that are injured or no longer needed. Uh, before we were born we all had webbing between our fingers and those cells were, were destroyed by something very similar to this. Okay. I think this is probably a good place to stop. The cytoskeleton will get on that in uh, the next video. Thanks for listening, guys.